Section eight of the Ingoldsby Legends First Series. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ingoldsby Legends First Series by Richard Harris Barham. Section eight. It is on my own personal reminiscences that I draw for the following story. The scene of its leading event was most familiar to me in early life. If the principal actor in it be yet living, he must have reached a very advanced age. He was often at the hall, in my infancy, on professional visits. It is, however, only from those who prated of his whereabouts that I learned the history of his adventure with the ghost. There stands a city, neither large nor small, its air and situation sweet and pretty. It matters very little, if at all, whether its denizens are dull or witty, whether the ladies there are short or tall, brunettes or blondes only there stands a city perhaps tis also requisite to minute that there's a castle and a cobbler in it a fair cathedral too the story goes and kings and heroes lie entombed within her their pious saints in marble pomp repose whose shrines are worn by knees of many a sinner there too full many an aldermanic nose rolled its loud diapason after dinner and there stood high the holy sconce of becket till four assassins came from france to crack it the castle was a huge and antique mound proof against all the artillery of the quiver ere those abominable guns were found to send cold lead through gallant warriors liver it stands upon a gently rising ground sloping down gradually to the river resembling to compare great things with smaller a well-scooped moldy stilton cheese but taller the keep i find's been sadly altered lately and stead of mail-clad knights of honour jealous in martial panoply so grand and stately its walls are filled with money-making fellows and stuffed unless i'm misinformed greatly with leaden pipes and coke and coals and bellows in short so many a change has come to pass tis now a manufactory of gas but to my tale before this profanation and ere its ancient glories were cut short all a poor hard-working cobbler took his station in a small house just opposite the portal his birth his parentage and education i know but little of a strange odd mortal his aspect air and gait were all ridiculous his name was mason he'd been christened nicholas nick had a wife possessed of many a charm and of the lady huntingdon persuasion but spite of all her piety her arm she'd sometimes exercise when in a passion and being of a temper somewhat warm would now and then seize upon small occasion a stick or stool or anything that round it lay and based her lord and master most confoundedly no matter tis a thing that's not uncommon tis what we all have heard and most have read of i mean a bruising pugilistic woman such as i own i entertain a dread of and so did nick whom sometimes there would come on the sort of fear his spouse might knock his head off demolish half his teeth or drive a rib in she shone so much in facers and in fibbin there's time and place for all things said a sage king solomon i think and this i can say within a well-roped ring or on a stage boxing may be a very pretty fancy when messrs burke or bendigo engage tis not so well in susan jane or nancy to get well milled by any one's an evil but by a lady tis the very devil and so thought nicholas whose only trouble at least his worst was that his ribs propensity for sometimes from the alehouse he would hobble his senses lost in a sublime immensity of cogitation then he couldn't cobble and then his wife would often try the density of his poor skull and strike with all her might as fast as kitchen wenches strike a light mason meek soul who ever hated strife 
of this same striking had a morbid dread he hated it like poison or his wife a vast antipathy but so he said and very often for a quiet life on these occasions he'd sneak up to bed grope darkling in and soon as at the door he heard his lady he'd pretend to snore one night then ever partial to society nick with a friend another jovial fellow went to a club i should have said society at the city arms once called the porta bello a spouting party which though some decry it i consider no bad lounge when one is mellow there they discuss the tax on salt and leather and change of ministers and change of weather in short it was a kind of british forum like john gale jones erst in piccadilly only they managed things with more decorum and the orations were not quite so silly far different questions too would come before em not always politics which willy-nilly their london prototypes were always willing to give one quantum suff of for a shilling it more resembled one of later date and tenfold talent as i'm told in bow street where kindlier natured souls do congregate and though there are who deem that same a low street yet i'm assured for frolicsome debate and genuine humour it's surpassed by no street when the chief baron enters and assumes to rule or mimic fessagers and brooms here they would oft forget their ruler's faults and waste in ancient lore the midnight taper inquire if orpheus first produced the waltz how gaslights differ from the delphic vapour whether hippocrates gave glauber's salts and what the romans wrote on ere they'd paper this night the subject of their disquisitions was ghosts hobgoblins sprites and apparitions one learned gentleman a sage grave man talked of the ghost in hamlet sheathed in steel his well-read friend who next to speak began said that was poetry and nothing real a third of more extensive learning ran to sir george villiers ghost and mrs veal of sheeted spectres spoke with shortened breath and thrice he quoted drelincourt on death nick smoked and smoked and trembled as he heard the point discussed and all they said upon it how frequently some murdered man appeared to tell his wife and children who had done it or how a miser's ghost with grisly beard and pale lean visage in an old scotch bonnet wandered about to watch his buried money when all at once nick heard the clock strike one he sprang from his seat not doubting but a lecture impended from his fond and faithful she nor could he well to pardon him expect her for he had promised to be home to tea but having luckily the key of the back door he fondly hoped that unperceived he might creep upstairs again pretend to doze and hoax his spouse with music from his nose vain fruitless hope the wearied sentinel at eve may overlook the crouching foe till ere his hand can sound the alarum bell he sinks beneath the unexpected blow before the whiskers of grimalkin fell when slumbering on her post the mouse may go but woman wakeful woman's never weary above all when she waits to thump her dearie soon mrs mason heard the well-known tread she heard the key slow creaking in the door spied through the gloom obscure towards the bed nick creeping soft as oft he had crept before when bang she threw a something at his head and nick at once lay prostrate on the floor while she exclaimed with her indignant face on how dare you use your wife so mr mason spare we to tell how fiercely she debated especially the length of her oration spare we to tell how nick expostulated roused by the bump into a good set passion so great that more than once he execrated ere he crawled into bed in his usual fashion the muses hate brawls suffice it then to say he ducked below the clothes and there he lay 
Twas now the very witching time of night, When churchyards groan and graves give up their dead, And many a mischievous enfranchised sprite Had long since burst his bonds of stone or lead, And hurried off with schoolboy-like delight To play his pranks near some poor wretch's bed, Sleeping perhaps serenely as a porpoise, Nor dreaming of this fiendish habeas corpus, not so our Nicholas, his meditations, Still to the same tremendous theme recurred, The same dread subject of the dark narrations, Which back with such authority he'd heard. Lost in his own horrific contemplations, He pondered o'er each well-remembered word, When at the bed's foot close beside the post, He verily believed he saw a ghost, Plain and more plain the unsubstantial sprite, To his astonished gaze each moment grew, Ghastly and gaunt it reared its shadowy height, Of more than mortal seeming to the view, And round its long thin bony fingers drew, A tattered winding sheet, of course all white, The moon that moment peeping through a cloud, Nick very plainly saw it through the shroud, and now those matted locks which never yet had yielded to the comb's unkind divorce their long contracted amity forget and spring asunder with elastic force nay e'en the very cap of texture coarse whose ruby cincture crowned that brow of jet uprose in agony the gorgon's head was but a type of nick's upsquatting in the bed from every pore distilled a clammy dew, Quaked every limb, the candle too, no doubt, On regla would have burnt extremely blue, But Nick unluckily had put it out, And he, though naturally bold and stout, In short was in a most tremendous stew, The room was filled with a sulphurious smell, And where that came from Mason could not tell. All motionless the spectre stood, and now Its reverend form more clearly shone confessed, From the pale cheek a beard of purest snow Descended o'er its venerable breast. The thin grey hairs that crowned its furrowed brow Told of years long gone by, an awful guest. It stood, and with an action of command, Beckoned the cobbler with its wan right hand. Whence and what art thou, execrable shape? Nick might have cried, could he have found a tongue, But his distended jaws could only gape, And not a sound upon the welkin rung. His gooseberry orbs seemed as they would have sprung, Forth from their sockets like a frightened ape. He sat upon his haunches bolt upright, And shook and grinned and chattered with affright. And still the shadowy finger, long and lean, Now beckoned Nick, now pointed to the door, And many an ireful glance and frown between, The angry visage and the phantom wore, As if quite vexed that Nick would do no more, Than stare without e'en asking, what d'ye mean? Because, as we are told, a sad old joke too, Ghosts, like the ladies, never speak till spoke to. Cowards, tis said, in certain situations, Derive a sort of courage from despair, And then perform from downright desperation, Much more than many a bolder man would dare. Nick saw the ghost was getting in a passion, And therefore groping till he found the chair, Seized on his awl, crept softly out of bed, and followed quaking where the spectre led, And down the winding stair with noiseless tread, The tenant of the tomb passed slowly on, Each mazy turning of the humble shed, Seemed to his step at once familiar grown, So safe and sure the labyrinth did he tread, As though the domicile had been his own, Though Nick himself in passing through the shop, had almost broke his nose against the mop. Despite its wooden bolt, with jarring sound, The door upon its hinges open flew, And forth the spirit issued yet around, It turned as if its followers' fears it knew, 
and once more beckoning pointed to the mound the antique keep on which the bright moon threw with such effulgence her mild silvery gleam the visionary form seemed melting in her beam beneath a ponderous archway's sombre shade where once the huge portcullis swung sublime mid ivied battlements in ruin laid sole sad memorials of the olden time the phantom held its way and though afraid even of the owls that sung their vesper chime pale nicholas pursued its steps attending and wondering what on earth it all would end in within the mouldering fabric's deep recess at length they reached a court obscure and lone it seemed a drear and desolate wilderness the blackened walls with ivy all o'ergrown the night-bird shrieked her note of wild distress disturbed upon her solitary throne as though indignant mortal step should dare so led at such an hour to venture there the apparition paused and would have spoke pointing to what nick thought an iron ring but when a neighbouring chanticleer awoke and loudly gan his early matins sing and then it started like a guilty thing as that shrill clarion the silence broke we know how much dead gentlefolks eschew the appalling sound of cock-a-doodle do the vision was no more and nick alone his streamers waving in the midnight wind which through the ruins ceased not to groan his garment too was somewhat short behind and worst of all he knew not where to find the ring which made him most his fate bemoan the iron ring no doubt of some trap-door neath which the old dead miser kept his store what's to be done he cried twere vain to stay here in the dark without a single clue oh for a candle now or moonlight ray for george i'm vastly puzzled what to do then clapped his hand behind tis chilly too i'll mark the spot and come again by day what can i mark it by oh here's the wall the mortar's yielding here i'll stick my all then rose from earth to sky a withering shriek a loud a long protracted note of woe such as when tempests roar and timbers creak and o'er the side the masts in thunder go while on the deck resistless billows break and drag their victims to the gulfs below such was the scream when for the want of candle nick mason drove his all in up to the handle scared by his lady's heart appealing cry vanished at once poor mason's golden dream for dream it was and all his visions high of wealth and grandeur fled before that scream and still he listens with averted eye when gibing neighbours make the ghost their theme while ever from that hour they all declare that mrs mason used a cushion in her chair end of section eight